Now, on 960 The Patriot, KKNT, it's the Middle East Radio Forum. Your chance to talk live about the turmoil in the Middle East. To get in touch with our guests, you can call in live right now at 602-508-0960. That's 508-0960. Now your host for the Middle East Radio Forum, attorney William J. Wolf. Good afternoon and Happy New Year. Welcome to a shortened version of Middle East Radio Forum. The second half hour has been preempted by the ASU Arizona basketball game. So to give my returning guest, author Devin Spear, as much time as possible, today there is no news, no commercials, and no random thoughts. However, I do want to announce that my website is up and running, and it's especially good because you can get about 10 or 11 past shows uh, anytime you want just by clicking on the website. The website address is host, that's H-O-S-T, at MiddleEastRadioForum.org, O-R-G. And uh, there's also a lot of information there, and you can also listen to the show on the Internet if you pull up my Internet uh, website, or you can call the station's website at kknt960.com. You can also access that anywhere in the world. The toll-free call number is 1-888-960-9696. That's good anywhere in the United States or Canada. And I do want to announce also that this show is replayed now every Sunday at 5 p.m. on 1360 a.m. That's the sister station to this station, 1360 a.m., 5 o'clock every Sunday. And at this time, I will say good afternoon to Devin Spear. How are you today? I'm fine, and thank you for having me again, Bill. I believe this is your third appearance on Middle East Radio Forum, and you're here, of course, because of this marvelous book you've written called The Future of Israel. I'm actually in my second go-through of the book. There's so much information there, I'll probably end up reading it three or four times before I'm finished. Uh, Can you please tell the audience what caused you to want to write this book? Well, I felt that uh, Israel had not been doing a good job of defending her cause, um, and I began speaking on her behalf. That was some years ago. Audiences would ask the question, um, where do we go from here? After, after the uh, recent intifada broke out and the peace process was an obvious failure, people would say, okay, we accept your analysis of the reasons for the failure. Where do we go from here? And I wrote this book in answer to that question. Okay, today we're going to talk specifically about proselytism. And uh, that's obviously uh, Jews trying to bring non-Jews into the fold, so to speak, to become Jews if they have any interest. Why do you think that's important? Well, I think um, that the Jewish people have suffered a great deal because they've abandoned proselytism, which is something they engaged in very actively and successfully in the ancient world. And uh, the result of them abandoning that was the Jews became a permanent minority, and a great deal of the suffering of the Jewish people over the last 2,000 years is directly attributable to the fact that we were a small minority at the mercy of larger forces. Is it true that most Jews believe that proselytism runs contrary to Judaism? I, sus- I, th- I feel that most Jews do feel that way, and I feel that they're in error, and uh, it does not run contrary to Judaism, and uh, that's not hard to prove. If we go into the Bible, we see that Judaism began with one man, Abraham, and it became a people because he converted Sarah, he converted all those around him and his own family. And when the Jews, when the Jews were... Um, Uh, Coming out of Egypt, it says in the Bible that a mixed multitude came out with them, and so they converted Egyptians. And it says that when the Jews returned from Babylonia, they converted the people of the land to Judaism. Okay, let me interrupt you here because uh, I've talked to you before the show, and we're going to give away a copy of your book. Again, the title is The Future of Israel to a caller who asked a question today. Now, we're not going to rate the questions, bad question, good question, this is the best question. What we're going to do is Gil is going to take down the first name and phone number of anybody who calls in with a question during the show, and he's going to put the names into a hat, and at the end of the show he's going to draw out one of the names for a free copy of The Future of Israel. So I will again repeat the call-in numbers, 602-508-0960, long distance is 888-960-9696, and if you're calling from out of the country, we will take a collect call, so there's no excuse for not calling. Okay, go ahead, please, Devin. Well, I was saying that uh, throughout the Bible, we see that uh, proselytes played a great role in the the nation. Uh, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, the uh, matriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel, were all converts to Judaism. Uh, Tzipora, 
who was Moses' wife and her father Jethro, were converts. And, of course, there's the Book of Ruth, which is the story of a convert whose ancestors, whose descendants become the kings of Israel through King David. Um, when the Maccabees returned from the exile, they re- realized that Judea would need to have a stronger power base and a larger population in order to compete in world affairs and against larger powers. And they went about a program of conversion of all the neighboring peoples. They converted the Edomites in the south. They converted the whole of Galilee and the area that's now known as the Golan. And millions of people, including entire nations, became Jewish at that time. Okay, so it would appear that the attitude of the sages of the Talmud would be very favorable toward they, proselytism. Yes, the, the sages were also very favorable towards proselytism. Uh, Hillel in Perkei Avot says that it is the mission of the Jewish people to bring the entire world uh, to God. And many of the rabbis, most of them felt that way. For example, Rabbi Eliezer uh, is said to have taught classes in which um, converts uh, were, were made. He also says, he's quoted as saying, uh, the proselyte is more beloved unto God than all those multitudes who stood at the foot of Mount Sinai. Another more, in other words, more beloved of, the, of God than the Jews themselves. And it actually shouldn't surprise us that the rabbis felt this way because many of them were um, proselytes themselves. For example, Rabbi Akiba is said in the, uh, in the Talmud to be a descendant of converts to Judaism. Uh, let's make sure that the audience is aware of what probably is the basis of Judaism, and that would be ethical monotheism. It's not just ethics. It's not just monotheism. It's got to be both. Ethical monotheism is the belief in one God and one God for all people, with one standard of proper conduct as expressed in the Ten Commandments uh, that's uh, applicable to everybody. And probably a lot of people, even Jews, are not aware of the basis of Judaism, which is this ethical monotheism, which was something that that was new, that was brought to the world. And and let me just add to that, that um, since uh, it is our mission to bring ethical monotheism to the world, uh, God does not expect us to keep that to ourselves. And I believe that Uh, Our covenant with God has two sides, and our side of the obligation is to bring ethical monotheism and God's law to the world. And if we don't do that, we're in fact not fulfilling our obligations under the covenant. And therefore, I think that our going out and spreading Judaism is intrinsic to the covenant with God. Now, you've probably already answered the question, what you've already stated here. Uh, Ancient Jews obviously converted people uh, into Judaism. Uh, did they actually go out and engage in missionary work, or is it just that they were welcome, welcoming to people who initiated the contact? Both were true. And uh, in the ancient world, the Jews were not as defensive as they are today uh, because of 2,000 years of Jewish powerlessness. And they used to uh, discuss openly their beliefs with their Greek and Hellenistic neighbors, and they made uh, millions of converts. At one time, 10% of the entire Roman Empire converted to Judaism including uh, the wife of the Emperor Nero, uh, important Roman senators and aristocrats. But the Jews actually engaged in missionary work. The rabbis had academies in Rome for that purpose. And there is a story, a very interesting story in the Talmud, in which four of the greatest rabbis, Akiba, Eliezer, and uh, Gamliel included, went to Rome to effect the complete conversion of one of the emperors, who they call Antonius. And the Talmud tells us that, in fact, he converted to Judaism, but secretly. Okay, I'm going to interrupt you here because we do have our first caller of the day, Keith, calling from Tempe. You're on the air with Devin Spear. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I wonder if uh, you believe that uh, celebrities converting to Judaism or celebrities embracing the Kabbalah uh, has any influence on uh, uh, the Jewish community in the uh, United States and if uh, it uh, helps or hurts uh, more uh, people converting. Like Madonna? Like Madonna, right. <laughs> okay, go ahead, please. Uh, it's an excellent question, and I, um, well, I don't, you know, I don't know what the real depth of Madonna's understanding of Kabbalah is. I will say this, that simply because she's a celebrity and she's interested, it creates a dynamic where I know many Jews who are not interested in Judaism at all, who are simply because Madonna's interested in it, and that in and of itself is a good thing. And I think that that is part of the dynamic that would be created if we actively sought converts. Uh, more and more people would be attracted to Judaism, and converts would themselves make Judaism more dynamic. And so we would have an upward spiral instead of the sort of stagnant zero-sum game which Judaism has been for two millennia. 
Okay, thanks very much for your call, Keith. You're entered into the running for a free book, and I will repeat that. We are going to give away one copy of Devin's book, The Future of Israel, to one of the callers today. We're not grading the questions. We're just going to put all the names into a hat, and Gil, at the end of the show, is going to be drawing a name. So please call the local number again, 602-508-0960, toll-free, 888-960-9696, out of the country. We will take a collect call from you. Uh, Devin, before I would I get any further into the discussion, there is one page from your book that I would like to read, and please bear with me. It's page 348 in the book, and I think it's so important that I do want to read it word for word, and I'll do it qu- fairly quickly. As the ancient world became more sophisticated, simplistic pagan beliefs began to lose their hold on the population. The greater sophistication of monotheism held an irresistible attraction, eventually taking over the Roman Empire and ultimately much of the world. The world, however, became ever more sophisticated, and today, again, Judaism has an opportunity to expand as in ancient times. Judaism seeks to approach God primarily through knowledge, and knowledge only through study. An appeal to abandon irrational dogma and instead seek God through study and reason will hold great attraction today, especially among intellectuals, and they are the key to influencing the masses. In essence, the West today is largely pagan rather than Christian. It is self-indulgent, lacks self-discipline, and is spiritually lost. Many worship only gold and hedonism. Western cultures have replaced the golden idols of the past with gold itself. Like false idols, the material possessions they put so much faith in are an illusion. We may delude ourselves to the contrary, but our material possessions add nothing to our character while we live, and we cannot take them with us when we die. Our honor, our sacrifice, our justice, on the other hand, these are the attributes which define our character in the eyes of others. Through them, we change and improve the world and create an everlasting memorial for ourselves after we are gone. Material things are transient, whereas these divine attributes of our character permanently impact the world. Material things created by man are temporary. They tarnish, they rust, they decay, and then disappear forever. The positive effect on the world of our sacrifice, honor, and justice are eternal. Presenting this Jewish message to our modern pagans will convince many and greatly benefit all who accept it. Again, that's page 348 of your very fine book. Uh, You know, it's interesting that a lot of people who make uh, nominally consider themselves Jews or Christians really are neither. They're just uh, uh, secular people, and I think they've lost a lot of the spirituality that you are advocating be returned to them. So I assume that what you're talking about is really not converting a... uh, a religious Christian, but mainly the people who really have no spirituality. Would that be a correct assumption? Very much so. That's why I call them our modern pagans. I think that someone who is a believing Christian, and although I may differ with his theology somewhat, if he uh, aims to do God's will and is trying to do good, uh, I, I see no reason to try to improve on that. What worries me is the complete godlessness of society that we live in, and the consequences of that are all around us. I think it's true that Jews and Christians are more similar than dissimilar because, as a basis, both faiths have ethical monotheism as their basis uh, founded in the Ten Commandments. Yes, I agree with you, and uh, the problem is not between Jews and Christians as I see it, but the problem is ultimately between those who believe that God, that is morality, matters, and those who believe it does not. Okay, we have another caller. This one's from out of state, from Chicago. Lenore, you're on the uh, air with Devin Spear. Go ahead, please. Um, I was wondering how we as Jews are living in mostly a uh, Christian community. How do we go about getting out to people and attracting people who might be interested? How do we find them? to bring them into the fold. That would really be the, a mechanism by which we could do this. That's really the essential question. Devin, go ahead, please. Thank yes, you. Yes, Lenore, uh, that's a very good question, and I think the answer is fairly straightforward. Um, I don't propose we go out and knock on doors like Jehovah's Witnesses. It's not our way. But um, after all, they do knock on our door. And I think that when a Christian comes and asks us to Uh, hear what he has to say, we should stop being so defensive because Christians often assume we have nothing to say, but rather we should invite him in, and I do this myself, and tell him that we will listen to his point of view, but he need also listen to ours. And I think in fairness, if he's going to state his view, he has to hear our reply. And I think we have a very powerful case, 
And so, first of all, whenever a, uh, a, a Christian asks you why you do not believe in Jesus, and how many of us have been asked that question every day, uh, rather than being defensive and clamming up, we state our case and we explain exactly what we do believe, and people will respect you for that. And I think that further than that, what we need to do is challenge the world intellectually. What we stopped doing in the ancient world was that we stopped challenging the world. And this is something the Jewish people are uniquely suited to. I mean writing books which will give Judaism as an answer to the modern uh, soullessness of the world, which will offer Judaism as an alternative to dogma and to the lack of spirituality, but offering to appeal to people's reason. And we already have great books on the shelf that are gathering dust, like uh, Nachmanides' Disputation in Barcelona and uh, Judah Halevi's Kuzari. And, I, and now that we are not forbidden by law to do these things anymore, I suggest we write more books and we answer these questions and we build whole libraries of Jewish polemics just as the Christians do. Okay, that's a great question, Lenore. Thanks for calling. You're entered into the drawing. And I think hand in glove with what you're saying, Devin, is that Jews need to understand what Judaism is. Too often, Jews don't understand their own faith. So self-education uh, before we become teachers, I think, is absolutely essential. Uh, we have another long-distance call. Uh, David from Skokie, you're on the air with Devin Spear. Go ahead, please. I'd just like to know, if the, uh, given the uh, resistance to proselytizing that uh, most Jews have, uh, uh, how you would go about convincing them that uh, this is the right path. And also, given the surge in Christian fundamentalism in the country, uh, how this could be seen in some ways as a negative toward, toward Jews if we b began to, maybe uh, the perception could be that we're beginning to try to, uh, in some ways, mimic the, uh, the Christian fundamentalists. Uh, thank you, David. It's a good question. The supposition of the Jews for 2,000 years has been that if we laid off converting Christians they would, um, and, and, and non-Jews, that they would uh, cease trying to convert us. And, of course, 2,000 years of Jewish history proves that this is not the case. So they have been trying to convert us. They are trying to convert us. And I think it's time that they heard our reply. Now, I like your question because you asked the fundamental question. You didn't say whether or not we would win converts. I think it's obvious that in this intellectual vacuum, we would win converts. You're not going to win everyone, but you win some of them. But your question was, how do we get the Jews to see that we need to do that? And the reason, and, and, and that, this is only one chapter in my book, The Future of Israel, and I explain why the loss of power has uh, caused us suffering, and that if the Jews are not in love with suffering, and they want to uh, pursue a more, um, a more positive path, they need to go out and challenge the world and become a greater force in the world than they are today, or we will always be persecuted. We have, or we purport to have, a universal message for the world. Now, you cannot have a universal message and keep it to yourself. That basic contradiction underlies anti-Semitism and is one of the reasons that we've always been accused of conspiracy and having ulterior designs. We need to openly state that we have a belief, that we believe it's true, and take it to the world. And I guarantee you the world will respect that more than, uh, than the secrecy which we currently advocate. David, thanks for your call. Uh, Devin, let's tell people how they can get a copy of your book. Well, the book, which is called The Future of Israel, is available, first of all, online at thefutureofisrael.net, but it's also available here in Phoenix at all the Judaica stores, at um, the uh, Jewish Quarter, at the uh, Scottsdale Kosher Market, at uh, Temple High Gift Shop, and those are the, the easiest ways to get a hold of it. Okay, and people can also contact my office at 602-279-1914 if they have a problem finding it, because I can certainly help them get a copy of the book. Okay, uh, we've got a lot of material in a very short time. If Jews were so successful uh, at proselytizing, why did they stop doing it? Uh, that's an excellent question, and the reason is fairly simple. In the year 339, the Emperor Constantine declared it illegal on the pain of death for Jews to do that, and when the Muslims took over the Middle East in the 7th century, they passed similar laws. Now, what happened is the Jews internalized these restrictions, and they convinced themselves that it was not authentically Jewish, and it was not in our interest to go out and convert the world. And, and this is, as we've just explained, not true in either case. Um, they deluded themselves that if they would stop doing this, the world would, on the other hand, leave them alone, and this hasn't happened. 
Okay, uh, Devin, you devoted an entire chapter uh, in the future of Israel to this uh, proselytism. Uh, why do you feel it's so important that uh, Jews resume? And specifically, we're talking about Israel, I believe. Yes, this all has to do with uh, with making a better life and and a brighter future for the state of Israel and the Jewish people as a whole. And as I said, we've suffered immensely because we did not do this, because we turned in on ourselves and Christianity went on to conquer the world. And the results of that are that Judaism has remained powerlessness and this powerlessness has cost us. But for beyond what it has cost us, it has cost the world. Uh, God gave us the Torah on Mount Sinai for a purpose. And it is, it is, you know, many Jews talk about tikkun olam, fixing the world. And I agree that tikkun olam is the Jewish mission. But you can't fix the world from a position of powerlessness. Only a world power can fix the world. And so what we need to do is, again, become an intellectual power and uh, go out and spread our message. And in doing this, we are going to, A, alleviate Jewish suffering, and B, alleviate human suffering, and that's our mission. Okay, we do have another caller, this one from Phoenix. Marion, you're on the air with Devin Spear. Go ahead, please. Oh, hi. It's, I'm Marion. Hi, Devin. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. Good, nice fine. to speak to you. Fine. Um, we have three daughters who, um, well, fortunately, they have wonderful marriages, two of them for 26 years already, and um, one for um, almost 15. But they've all intermarried, and it was hard on my husband um, being brought up um, very orthodox. Um, and I was brought up reformed, so but it was... We went to the rabbi 34 years ago in Chicago, our rabbi, and when they were only 16, that's when our first daughter met her husband, and even just dating, and where did she meet him? In an AZA meeting. He was the, just the Mary, walk of the door. He went to an AZA meeting with all of his Jewish friends. Marion, can you ask your question, please? We're well, very the question far on time. is, I mean, um, unfortunately that it happened, but you just have to learn to accept it as parents sometimes. Okay. I mean, I don't know if you agree or not. That's what the rabbi told us. Um, well, I think if you live in a in a largely non-Jewish society as we do, uh, yes, you must accept that. But I think we need to make Judaism so attractive and so dynamic uh, that that people will convert to Judaism not only because they marry a Jew, because they're intellectually attracted to it. And this will, will make Jews themselves look into their Judaism more favorably, just the way that Madonna's Kabbalah, whatever it is, has made Jews look into their Judaism more favorably. Thanks very much for your call, Marion. Devin, how do you envision Jewish uh, proselytizing now? Door-to-door -door like Jehovah's Witnesses or perhaps m missionary work like Mormons? No, what I think we need to do and what we're suited to do is, um, first of all, average Jews can speak to everyone they know when the question comes up. Rather than being defensive, they can explain their ideas. Uh, and secondly, uh, if you have the capabilities of writing articles, writing books, uh, about something we believe in, we ought to do that, and we ought to make Judaism an alternative to the godlessness and soullessness around us. Uh, I think we can offer a more rational and reasonable alternative than radical Islam on the one hand, and then certain Catholic dogmas on the other. Uh, we appeal to God through reason, and I think that if we appeal to people from a basis of reason, of reaching God through study and reason, which is the Jewish way, uh, there are going to be a lot of people, particularly among the intellectual class, that are going to be very attracted to that. The, the, the Messiah of communism has died, and there is a vacuum replacing it. And I think we have something to offer. I think there's a vacuum, and in a vacuum, a good idea will spread very quickly. And, of course, as I said before, I hate to beat a dead horse, but the number one thing is first the Jews have to educate themselves so that they know what they're talking about. So when they're speaking to somebody, they can then talk intelligently about what the issues are. Okay, so you think Jews will be successful if they do this, is that correct? I do. Uh, I think that there are many people, even without our trying, who are very attracted to Judaism. I meet them all the time, but we don't have our arms open to them. We have no institutional format to accept them the way Christianity does. And I think that if we did, there are a tremendous number, I would say millions, and I might, I might estimate tens of millions in this country who could conceivably convert to Judaism. And I propose that we do just that. I think we will be doing a great service to the future of the Jewish people. And more than that, I think we'll be doing God's will and we'll be doing a great service to these people as well. Okay, uh, we have another caller, Steve from Phoenix. Go ahead, you're on the air with Devin Spear. Go ahead, please. 
Yes, uh, you mentioned the conversion. Now, if this is to have an effect on the population of Israel, this would be under Orthodox law, which means men would have to undergo circumcision if they're grown, and there has always been somewhat of resistance to that. Could you comment on that? Uh, That's an excellent question, Steve. And I have not, in fact, uh, in my own mind, decided what the answer to that is. What I do in the future of Israel, and again, this is only one chapter in the book, is lay out broad ideas of what we ought to strive for. I'm trying to give the Jewish people and the state of Israel a focus uh, as to where we have to be 100 years from now, 500 years from now, 1,000 years from now. I'm not laying out, and I cannot lay out in a... I, even in a book, and certainly not in a short interview, all the details of how we do that. Um, and those are ki- the kind of uh, questions you brought up have to be discussed and debated within ourselves, within the Jewish community, and we have to conclude, we have to come to a conclusion. And let me just say, we have to come to a conclusion. Let me repeat that, because we have a tendency to debate things ad infinitum and think that the debate in itself is holy and not to conclude. And that comes from thousands of years of Talmudic reasoning. There is a time to debate, and there is a time to come to conclusions. One of the strengths of Christianity is that in the end, they debated, but they concluded. I'm not advocating dogma, but I'm advocating that we create a plan and we follow it through. And it's almost like what you talk about in the book, The Future of Israel. Israel has to conclude, where are their borders? And that's, a, and that's another example. Uh, we haven't done that because we're trying to leave open the possibility for negotiation, in a result of which we've left a vacuum which the enemy has come in to fill. And uh, same thing applies in many fields. I'm afraid the Jewish people have a tendency to over-intellectualize, to talk rather than to do. And Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel said, um, uh, doing is the thing. And I think that's a very important uh, advice. Uh, you have to conclude things, otherwise uh, you discuss them forever. Uh, before we run out of time, uh, one more time, Devin, please tell how people they, how they can get a copy of your book. Well, they can get it if they're located outside of Phoenix and anywhere in the world on thefutureofisrael.net, where you can read uh, excerpts, you can read the first chapter, read reviews, and you can order the book. And if you're local in Phoenix, you can get it in the Jewish Quarter, uh, you can get it in the Scottsdale Kosher Market, and you can get, get it at the uh, Temple High Bookshop, the Temple High Gift Shop. Okay, thanks very much, Devin. Uh, Gil, do you have a winner for the uh, free book? I think we're probably toward the end of the show. I think we've had, what, five calls? Marion from Phoenix, you want a free copy of the book? It will be here at the uh, studios, uh, fifth floor, 40, excuse me, 2423 uh, East Camelback. It'll have your name on it. Come and get your book anytime during the week, 9 to 5. Devin, I appreciate your being here. Uh, Unfortunately, the show is being truncated by the fact that there's a basketball game taking uh, up the last half hour of the show. I'm absolutely going to have you on again. You're a wonderful guest, and there's so much to discuss from your book. I highly recommend it. And my listeners, if you get a copy of the book and you read it before Devin appears on the show again, you can ask more questions about it. I mean, it's a wonderful opportunity for all of you to learn a lot about uh, Devin's idea of the future of Israel. Agree or disagree, the book is too important not to read. Next week, we have a representative of the Technion University in Haifa to discuss some of the uh, world-class achievements they have made, and also Dr. Steve Carroll, history professor, will be back to discuss the uh, situation with Libya injecting itself into the Middle East conflict, how a uh, obscure and hostile country did interject themselves. Again, my website is host at MiddleEastRadioForum.org. You can access some of the older shows. They're archived there for you to do that. And it's a wonderful opportunity to take a look at some of the old shows and other things. I'm going to put a lot of links on the uh, website so that you can get other sites that have a lot of information. Uh, put, I'm going to put Devin Spears' website on the uh, website also. Thank you very much for being with us. I look forward to your being on the show next week with us. And please stay tuned for the uh, Arizona State, Arizona basketball game coming up right after the show. Again, thanks very much. And unfortunately, we're going to have commercials next week. I'm going to ask you again to utilize the services of my advertisers as that's how the show is brought to you. But that'll be again next week. Thanks again for listening.